long, long time ago in a country far, far away. In a city called Mashhad, Iran. When I was growing up, I uh, looked at the night skies and looked at the stars and imagined myself floating up and touching them. I drew a picture of my flight to space. I drew this beautiful spaceship that would take me to my stars, and I showed it to everyone. I showed it to my parents, to friends, to family, to everyone, to my teachers, and I told them I'm going to go to space. And of course, you know, they looked at me, they smiled, they said, "Ah, oh, nice, this is really good. How are you going to go up there? I said, this is my spaceship. And they looked at me, and they, um, I could tell that they were not taking me seriously. So I decided I'm going to prove them wrong. So I did. I did go to space, and I did go to space on a rocket ship that resembled what I drew, just to prove them I could predict the future. And that has been the story of my life. Everyone who knows me, they know not to challenge me. If you tell me I cannot do something, I'm going to prove you wrong. The Soyuz TMA-9 and the Expedition 14 crew now uh, coming into view uh, just uh, over the limb of the Earth as uh, Mikhail... The only thing I was anxious about is making sure that I will be in space. If something was uh, supposed to blow up, I was just praying that, please blow up after I'm in space. <laughs> I don't want all this to be for nothing. Finally, everything checked out, and they said, okay, you can open up your seatbelt. And for the first time, I floated up, and I experienced the microgravity. And, and as I floated up, uh, there was a window next to me, a portal, and I looked out and saw Earth. And it was such an emotional moment for me. expected I'm like it's gonna look like the picture I've been seeing but it was so different when you look at it with your own eyes it it has an energy that you don't feel from the picture it has this energy of life and and it was warm and alive and and it was like I was crying I was laughing I was excited it was such a mix of emotion now this view from uh, external cameras on the International Space Station showing the Soyuz over southern Russia near the Kazakh border in the Caspian Sea. I started thinking about my childhood and, you know, a, a summer night looking at the night sky and it was like this whole thing was playing in my head like a movie of all the dots that had to connect, 
all the people that had helped me, nudged me toward this direction. And everything that resulted in me being at that moment sitting in that capsule on top of that rocket. And I was just so grateful and I was like, this is it, this is what I meant to do and I'm here and it's going to happen. We have contact and capture. Docking confirmed. Contact and capture confirmed at 9.21 a.m. Moscow time, 12.21 a.m. Central time. There she is. Anusha, I'm sorry, on board. Anusha, you made the whole world looking at you. Thank you, I wouldn't be here without you. Dreamers know we're dreamers, we just try to resist dreaming. Because we've been told that dreaming is dangerous, dreaming is irresponsible, dreaming is worthless. Just live the life. If you, if you live in truth, live in transparency, live in authenticity, if you speak your truth, it will vibrate at the highest vibration. I'm an inventor, I'm told. What do inventors do? Look at the problems everybody looks at and figure out a different way to express the problem because that will probably then make some alternative solution pretty straightforward. For me, it's about getting started. It doesn't matter how big, you just have to take that first step. You don't have to be successful right out of the gate. I can't think of a musician or an artist or an athlete that went out and started winning tournaments the second they started trying. 150 years ago this year, Willard Bundy invented the time clock. And the time clock was really transformative because what it said is, if you don't own the place, you are selling me your time. And I'm going to do whatever I can to extract as much as I can from your time as possible. And it pushed us all to become cogs, to become compliant elements in a machine. And it doesn't matter if you're a fancy lawyer or a surgeon, or it doesn't matter if you work at Tim Hortons, you're a cog. But something has shifted in our world in the last 20 years, and it's an awakening that people are realizing they don't have to take that bargain if they don't want to. I run a company called Archangel, which is a, a tribe and community of superhero entrepreneurs who want to make the world better, make a ton of money to make an even bigger impact. And a lot of the pain points are, you know, we need to learn how to grow, we need cash flow. And I thought, how can we do something really special and unique and different that disrupts the way business works and disrupts the way philanthropy works? And I thought, what if we actually created something where we sell something people want and then take the profit from it and use that to give micro loans to entrepreneurs who are growing, making an impact? I thought, oh, well, I'm, I'm in the event space. I love doing events. I live in Toronto. I need to do something huge. So we literally rented the biggest theater in Canada. And then I reached out to some of my superhero crazy friends like yeah. uh, Gary Vaynerchuk and Seth Godin, Robin Sharma, Gretchen Rubin. I said, listen, yeah. we're doing this event. The whole purpose is to fill a room with entrepreneurs who want to make a huge impact and have you guys on stage sharing your best wisdom to help them grow. One thing I've discovered is that your, your gift is often next to your, your wound or next to your curse or next to the pain you've experienced. And the thing I wish I had growing up was someone to believe in me. So when I was in fifth grade, the school did IQ testing and I have a really high IQ and I was labeled as gifted. And you know, my parents and teachers all said this was a great thing. And a weird thing happened where I started getting bullied for being too smart. And I distinctly remember one day a group of kids surrounding me telling me to stop doing so well on my tests because I made them look bad. And I actually, I went home crying to my parents. And I had this negative trigger and trauma around the word gifted, I hated it. And then in high school, I discovered comic books, fell in love with Spider-Man and Iron Man. But when I opened my very first X-Men comic, on the very first page, it said Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters. And there was that word gifted again, but now it meant superpower. And I had this crazy paradigm shift that the word gifted meant superpower. My parents love me, they still love me, they're amazing. And they wanted the best for me, but they came from that generation of get a job, get a safe job, get benefits, all those types of things. And 
I started in the real estate industry in 2010 and did really, really well and secretly hated it. And then I got trapped and it's such a weird place to be. You get trapped with a reputation and fame in a little bubble of an industry where you're well known and you're in magazine articles and you're touted as an award-winning person and doing a thing and trying to explain to people that I'm miserable. And it showed up physically. I was overweight and it was hard to talk to anybody about this. But then the one positive that came out of it was that it afforded me the chance to start going to mastermind groups and conferences and investing in personal development where I got to meet some of the most amazing humans on the planet. It uncovered my ability and my superpower, my gift to believe in others. I am obsessed with finding people who want to change the world and believing in them. I want to see anyone who is inspired to make change, I want to help them make it happen. If you feel like a rebel, if you feel like a misfit, if you feel like you don't fit in, like you stand out, if you've been told to stop dreaming, I want you to pay attention to what we're all saying in this film. I want you to listen to us. I want you to dream bigger. As a child, whatever makes you stand out is a clue to what your gift is and what your superpower could be. I'll say it like this, when she was born, when I was older than her, I could see her eyes were just like, I'm ready to conquer, I'm, I'm not being facetious when I tell you this now. She, her eyes indicated that she was ready to conquer the world. And her eyes were sparkling and looking sideways and up and down. She had no limitations in her body when she was the first day or two old. And it, that little moment gave me a, a feeling of, you know, this girl's not gonna have any problems, you know, and she didn't. If you spend time with Jessica, you can't even, t you, you probably wouldn't even realize she didn't have arms. She's just so adapted to using her feet for everything. And so um, I knew that she, you know, I, I just, by meeting her and talking to her, I knew she could fly an airplane if, if she could do it mentally, is, you know, if she had the aptitude to do it. So. I remember when I found out Jessica was a pilot, it was after we had had a party at a friend's house. And after the party, we walked outside, Jessica had left, and a few of us were just hanging out outside, and somebody said, you know, I think I've seen her before. I saw her on Ellen or something. She's a pilot. And I said, what? She flies an air, she's a black belt. Jessica took a class with me. We've been training ever since, and now she's a fourth degree black belt, and I'm a fifth degree black belt. If you don't see limitations, the world will open up to you. You might want a, a shot of that. It's my favorite shirt. I love the word dreamer because as a dreamer, you don't see limitations and you don't see obstacles. You just see the big dream or the goal. And uh, my whole life has been kind of like that, where I set little goals um, up and I don't see the negative, I see the dream. And it has allowed me to pursue something without giving up. My mom was a huge part of my life. She really instilled in me that I could do anything because there were times when I had doubts because people came to me and said, you can't do that, you don't have arms, or they doubted what I could achieve. And having that kind of negative impact from strangers or people who don't even know me, it had an effect on me that made me go to my mom and ask her, you know, what can I do without arms? And she said, you can do anything. And she lived that motto as well. 
I think I had phenomenal parents that gave me a foundation. They listened to me, they talked to me, and having that kind of support made me more resilient. My wife passed away, but while my wife was around, she uh, was very pleased with Jessica's progress, I think, and she stayed up till 11 or 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning studying her homework a lot of times. I think she made mostly A's. I don't know that she made any B's. When I was in college, I thought I was going to become a doctor. I actually went in to do pre-med. I did all the science courses and then took organic chemistry, which was supposedly the hardest class on campus. And it took a couple times to pass it. But I realized, well, maybe I should consider some other options. And I decided to take some psychology classes. I fell in love with psychology and I loved that connection between how our attitude affects our lives. And so I thought, well, why not consider becoming a speaker? Or at the time, it was really, really cold outside and I was wearing a sleeveless vest, so it was obvious that I didn't have any arms. We were out in the snow and there was a stranger coming by and I started crying and I said, I asked the stranger, I said, would you please help me find my mittens? I can't find them. <laughs> and we looked for them for 30 minutes until she finally caught on and I'm like, gotcha. <laughs> well, we always want to know what's the A to Z route and we want to try and follow this worn route and it just doesn't work because of the level of disruption. Just all these things changing, all these institutions changing. So if you're looking at somebody and be like, okay, they took this path, they went to law school and then they became this and then they did that, you're gonna be 10 years out of date by the time you get to where you wanna go. Be the weirdo, be the, the you know, we call them maverick misfits and weirdos. Like be that, that kind of person because if you follow the, the norm, you're pretty much only gonna to get to where the average or norm is. I realized that being a memorable person is actually beneficial as a speaker. People will listen to you, people will pay attention to you, it'll catch their attention. But it wasn't until college that I started to really embrace the difference. And I like to use cups with handles, makes it easier. Jessica has really defined herself as an independent person. It's one of those things people think isn't possible because of her visible disability. Part of her identity for so long was proving to people that she could be independent. She can get herself dressed and undressed. She can brush her teeth in the morning. She can comb her hair. She can cook on the stove. She can do dishes. She can assemble a salad. She can use a keyboard and use a computer and a mouse. Her phone will even recognize her toe print as if it was a fingerprint and unlock for her. I kind of like to play the little games once in a while. I'll, kind of, I'll be at the university rec center and I'll be swimming and I'll, I'll jump in the pool and, and kind of sink to the bottom for a little bit and see if people... <laughs> I love to get the lifeguard's attention. I was invited to a number of places locally in town after an article came out that said I wanted to become a speaker after college. And one of those first places was a Rotary Club meeting and there at that Rotary Club meeting, a fighter pilot came up to me and said, how would you like to go fly in an airplane? And I'd never been in an airplane my entire life, a small plane. When I think back to that first flight, it must have been that feeling of a taste of controlling something in the air. I've been driven to be independent my whole life. And I guess that feeling, association of empowerment and independence that I made with that first time flying I was connected and wanted to do more of it. Jessica approached me and asked me if I was interested in teaching her and I said sure and I asked her um, if she had driven to the flying and she said yes, yeah. she drove up there by herself and I said well sure, I think if you drive a car you ought to be able to fly an airplane. This was a whole world of questions because no one had ever done this without arms and hands and I didn't know if anyone had attempted to fly a plane with her feet. Pitch. I can pull all the way out, push all the way in. There's this myth that if you have a disability, you automatically get a superpower. That's not true. 
There are lots of people with disabilities who are lazy or don't have superpowers, just like in the non-disabled community. I am deafblind, and people with disabilities know what it's like to have your dreams squashed. Society is constantly saying, no, you can't do that. It's too dangerous. It's not safe. It's impossible. What sets one apart is the drive to want to develop your skills. In order to get your license, you have to be able to control the plane by yourself. You have to be able to solo that plane. And that requires the instructor physically getting out of the plane and you taking over that airplane and flying it like a safe pilot. <laughs> and landing safely, of course. Yes, that, that scares me though, you know. I mean, just flying, you know, was scary enough. The day that she was supposed to solo, we had a group of people at the airport. Well, um, what happened was, I don't know if she tells you this story or not, but here's a true story. I invited all my friends and family to the airport. We had this catering at the nearby country club. Jessica had several people, media people and other people show up. And it was too windy for her to solo. I don't think it was on her mind to fly that day or she was thinking about other things maybe. He did not feel I was ready to solo that day. I taxied out with her and I told her I'm not going to let you solo. Even if you're good enough, I'm not going to do it. And she was a little bit upset, I think, at me. So I was bummed. I went home and slept the night. Next morning she went to the airport with her trainer. She got out there at five in the morning and it was myself, Jessica, and two people that worked for me. Nobody else. And he said, okay, you're ready now. <laughs> so she took off and did her solo. She did a beautiful job, but she, she went missed. She came around the first time the landing. She wasn't comfortable with the way that was put in the landing, so she zoomed back into the air which is fine, that's what she was trained to do. She did exactly what she was supposed to do, but of course it scared the heck out of me as a flight instructor. I'm like, what are you doing, what are you doing? But she did very well. It was a great solo and, and great landing, and she did very well. It's this incredible feeling of accomplishment. It's like there's no other feeling of independence and freedom up there. the first certified armless pilot. The Guinness World Record had to record it as first female pilot to fly an airplane with her feet. I don't understand why they had to say female because as far as I'm concerned, I don't know of any male who has done it. So perhaps there's someone out there or they just had to do it for the purposes of the record. I don't know. I should probably find out one day. <laughs> yeah, but still, that's, how does that feel to have that kind of... I'm proud of the act in itself. Refusing to give up is like the story of my life and not taking no uh, for an answer is something is every day for me because being born without arms, people automatically assume there are limitations. And as a dreamer, I don't see the limitations. This is all I've ever known and I just learn to work with what I have and I find a way. Look at Jessica Cox, someone who dreams of being a pilot and has no arms, and yet she figured out how to do it. What an incredible inspiration for all of us to be told no and to find a way anyways. Why not me? Why not? Why not me? Like, there's just no excuse for anybody to not win. There just isn't. There's someone who's had a worse situation than you, who has overcome it and won at the highest level in everything, in business, in finance, in life, in love, in everything. There's the templates, just look at them. Pretending that you can't do it is all on you. So that's, I, I just go, why not me? Yeah. I think it's so hard to judge your mess when you're a child because we all want to be accepted, we all want to be liked. I remember myself when I was a child, I wanted people to like me more than I wanted to be successful, so I would hide my gifts, I would hide my talents, and I, f I felt like I had tall poppy syndrome. I was actually quite tall, but <laughs> also other gifts I had, I would hide them. And so what I would say to kids that know that they're special, that know that they have something going on inside, is that your mess is your message. And it might be hard right now, but ultimately the things that are the most painful are the things that are going to strengthen you, and it's going to be the thing that gives you superpowers when you're in a 
adult. It's a thing that's going to make you unique to stand out from the crowd, which right now we want, we might want to fit in. But as we become adults, it's really how do we differentiate? How do we highlight our uniqueness? It's not about being perfect. It's about advancing and progressing beyond what you believe is currently possible. And in my book, Limitless, I introduced the Limitless model. And it's a Venn diagram, three circles that intersect, three M's. The first M stands for mindset. Mindset. And mindset I'm defining as what you believe you deserve, what you believe is possible, what you believe you are capable of. The second circle is motivation. And your motivation really is your purpose and having energy to be able to achieve something. And then finally, the third M is methods. Methods, and these are the processes, the strategies, the mechanics on how to, for example, read faster, on how to remember another language, on how to be more productive. So as you're looking at this diagram where you see mindset intersect with motivation, you have something called inspiration. You have inspiration, but it's lacking the methods. So you could be very inspired, but you don't know what to do, and that's a challenge. Where motivation crosses over with methods, you know what to do, and you're motivated to be able to use that. This is the area, this crossover of implementation implementation because you're motivated and you know what to do. The challenge is you're missing the mindset. So you're always going to be capped in terms of what you believe you're capable of and what you believe is possible and what you believe you deserve. Now, if you have the mindset and the methods, that area of crossover is ideation. It stays in your mind and you're just having ideas about it, but you're not doing something because you're not motivated because you're lacking the motivation. Where you have all three of them combined, you have the limitless state. The fourth I is integration. It's really who you are. And that's the place that we want to be able to live from, to be able to create from, to be able to dream from. A Los Angeles Times reporter interviewing the first participant in Orlando in, I think, 1997 or something, saying, you know, I, I never thought I could do anything and never, nobody thought I would be anything ever in my life. And I was a member of gang. He was the head of his gang. And because he got fired up through first, he got admitted to college and graduated from Berkeley. And the reporter said, what's the bandage? And the kid said, I, I got my tattoos removed. And the reporter said, you got your gang tattoos removed? Yeah. You don't need your game? No. I've got NASA. And he's now back in his own neighborhood, helping kids that are in the same situation he was in. Three, yes. It's not a science fair masquerading as something that's fun. Science fairs aren't even fun for people that like science. Watching nerdy people do stupid things on the folding bridge table in the basement of the middle school is not fun. It's stupid. Our speaker today needs no introduction to this audience. He holds hundreds of US and foreign patents. Dean also received the National Medal of Technology in 2000. While he was still a college student, he invented the auto syringe, an automatic infusion pump that delivers precise doses of medication. He invented what he probably is most famous for, the Segway. But really, one of the most exciting things is his incredible focus on education. He founded FIRST for inspiration and recognition of science and technology to achieve his education goals. Dean Kamen is an intellectual and energy fireball. He's going a thousand miles an hour all the time. He's always aimed over the horizon. From the beginning, Dean was anxious to change the world. He's the real-life Iron Man. He literally has a workshop in his house like Iron Man where he builds and creates and invents. One thing that Dean came and inspired me with is the idea that not everything is going to work. 
but it doesn't mean you don't try. At the risk of just embarrassing myself one more time, I still got to figure out why this thing won't go into... I have a feeling it might work now. Let's see. That's so annoying. Look, I swear to you, it, it climbs stairs. But it certainly does stand up. You got to imagine what it's like to be able to just cruise up and down stairs, climb over hills, look people in the eye. I can, I can lean on this bar and have a beer with you. In fact, would anybody like a beer? Oh, this. But on tap, I have Guinness, if you'd like any of that. I got a call last week from a guy named Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> and Buzz Aldrin said, Dean, 50 years ago, I walked on the moon. Now he's having trouble walking. And he says, I don't want to be in a wheelchair. I want an iBot. Yeah. So I hope we're going to present him with this in New York on the 25th. I was born at a young age. Uh, I don't remember the event. I did not know as a little kid. I had no idea what other people thought it meant to understand something. And since I understood almost nothing around me, I felt chronically confused and stupid. Then I went to school and I was sort of told that school is where you learn things. So I figured they're going to explain the world to me. Well, it didn't seem to have that effect on me. Did you know that George Washington was born in 1732? I don't know why that fact is important, but it's a piece of history. Do you know that the square root of three is 1.732? And I'm looking at the math book and there's table. I see 1.732. What does George Washington have to do with the square root of three? What does the square root of three is 1.7. He was born in say. Now they have no relationship to each other, none. Today everybody calls it ADD. The little kids have ADD, attention deficit disorder. So I had my own disease. I had ASD. I had attention surplus disorder. I hardly think that a mathematics class is a place for that sort of thing. They gave you Newton's laws. F equals MA. And I'm told that Isaac Newton was one of the greatest geniuses of all time. Okay, F is a number, it equals another number, M times A. This number equals this times this. It's just such a trivial equation, it's useless. A equals B. Okay, I got a great idea. A equals B times a constant. It's a straight line. So Isaac Newton is the greatest genius of all time and he gave us the simplest mathematical equation you could possibly write that's not trivial. Uh, I don't think so. So there's something about that F equals MA thing I don't get. But what he really said is that the motion of all bodies, no matter how big or small, is proportional to a force. He gave us a set of relationships which turned out to be beautifully, elegantly simple to understand by what happened to be a simple first order linear equation. But then I'm thinking, if he's such a genius and it took his whole life to give us this stuff, how come we got 45 minutes this week on this subject between, I don't know, again, phonics and reading, and I'm supposed to understand in 45 minutes something that took the greatest genius of all time a lifetime to do, and then we're off to another subject. But he wrote a book. So I went and I got a copy of Principia. As you read this entire book, you'd start to see the context. Why was he thinking about inertia and force and acceleration and the motion of the planets and the motion of the moon? And I did the same thing with Galileo, two new sciences. I got a copy of Euclid stuff. And all of this stuff is painstaking to read and reread and break a pencil and try again and see, ah, now I really get it. And it is elegant and it is beautiful. But by then, you know, they've gone through half a lifetime in school and I didn't understand that their definition of understand was different than mine. The current model isn't set up for everybody. There are certain people that 
can thrive, especially if you're good at memorizing. And yet there's so much opportunity for the education model to be changed, to be disrupted, where focus can go more towards helping younger people uncover and discover what are their superpowers and then building curriculum around that. How do you teach that intellectual curiosity to your children? It's not about teaching them the right answers. It is about asking them to think about what is possible. Today, most people will look at the stuff and saying, you know, it's, you know, my job is to take this kid to the water, but I just have to force him to drink because that's really is what's needed. And I keep wondering, what if we change our focus from that to make the kids thirsty? Because when you make them thirsty, you never have to take them to the water because they will find their own water and they will drink. Right? How do you make them thirsty? Intellectual curiosity is that create that thirst. You were late for school this morning, but then you're almost always late. You're in a rut with a bad habit. Here's the worst part. A lot of the people who are just super, super smart and they really are bored with what they're learning. You weren't listening. You seldom do. It's a habit of yours. They are described as ADHD and they're now being drugged. Or do you always drum with your fingers? I mean, I can tell you that all three of our children were considered ADHD. And if you look at every one of them, is kicking ass today, right? Our 29 year old is now on the cover of every magazine. Our daughter started an AI company. Our youngest one just graduated from Stanford. He's a Schwarzman scholar. What is it? They, they did not have ADHD. They just were smart and they learned very quickly and people thought they had ADHD. So my point is, every single one of these dreamer, you just have to keep bringing this intellectual curiosity. Don't kill that. Every time they come back and say, what if? Ask them, yes, tell me what if. Preparing for the future must begin as always with our children. 30 years ago, everybody I know was saying, we have an education crisis in this country. Our children should master the basic concepts of math and science. Why did they all say that? Because there was data that said we're producing way fewer engineers per capita than any industrialized country. In fact, we're producing way fewer competent engineers than most developing countries. And they assumed it's the education crisis. Well, if you misdiagnose your problem, you're unlikely to solve it. The United States spends far more per capita on education than any country in the world. We can afford to. It's about 50% of all local taxes. So it can't be, let's put a little more money there. If it was 1%, you could double it and go to 2%. If it's already half your money, you're not gonna double it, right? So I said, let's assume for a second, it's not at all an education crisis, it's a culture crisis. By the time they're five or six years old, every kid's already got his head or her head full of the serious role models that they want to emulate. And it's not Archimedes and Einstein. By the time they're five years old, any kid on any street anywhere can tell you the name of a whole lot of people from the NBA, the NFL, Hollywood, they can tell you a whole lot of famous singers. Go to a newsstand, every cover. It's either about sports, it's about entertainment, it's about beautiful women, that's it, that's it. The vast majority of professional actors I know are very unhappy at the cycle of auditions, at the fact that they're not recognized, at the fact that going on Broadway pays the minimum wage. Go learn to be a doctor because the deck is stacked against you and spending that time to be the one in a million to play in the NBA, in that amount of time, we know you could be an emergency room doctor and that you could get prestige and money and satisfaction and change people's lives and still play basketball every weekend. A good inventor would never waste his or her time reinventing anything that already works. You just systems integrate things that other people spent billions of dollars developing. You know what works to inspire kids to get really good at something? Sports. So I said, why don't we just make science and technology and engineering and mathematics and inventing a sport? First, we are for the inspiration and recognition of science and technology. 
We're from Hawthorne High School. Bringing kids here uh, gives them an experience that they don't get in their small community. Uh, we live in the middle of Los Angeles, right next to LAX Airport, and most of them don't know that the Pacific Ocean is right next to them. We fly across the country. We get to sit with all these different cultures from around the world, watching everybody fight the same challenges, building robotics, and coming up with way different answers. I'm actually originally from El Salvador in Central America. We are from Shawnee, Oklahoma. From Israel. Michigan. I just got into college! <laughs> it's really empowered me to try new things. Um, when I came onto the team, uh, onto my first team, I didn't know where I, what my place was in high school or in life or in anything, but then I just kind of fell into place on a first team, in a first environment. I would go to competitions, I would make new friends. <laughs> To me, it's really important that kids develop a self-image that includes knowing that they can do something that's hard, knowing that they can do something that's creative, knowing that they can do something with others, for others. And I think that that rational self-esteem has to come from inside, not because somebody else gave them an A on a test, but because they know. Help me count it down. I read a statistic when my son was young, about three years old, that 66% of African-American male children in Los Angeles go to prison. So I knew the statistic got, that I got to beat, not on my watch. So oftentimes I'm, I'm interviewed with, what inspired you, Lisa? And I say, my inspiration is seasonal, um, and seasons be five years, you know, 10 years. And my first inspiration wasn't, I wasn't aspiring to something. I was outrunning something. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't like, oh, I want to be, you know, Jim Rome. I want to be Oprah. No, it was, I, my child will not see a prison, <laughs> and he will not see lack and scarcity. He will not fight the Harlem Crip 30s and the Rolling 60s three days a week to to get home from school. He will not, he will not, he will not, you know, and I will not, I will not. So when I look at kids today and they're in those environments, I pray that a coach grabs them or a teacher grabs them or their parents protect them. Because in the little ordinary child is an extraordinary dreamer fighting to get out. I didn't, I didn't rank on anybody's Richter scale as exceptional, no one's. I was a C student. I was an average athlete. So no one knew who I could become. So it's really easy not to see me. And I always say, watch out. You might work for the C student one day. <laughs> about 15 years ago, I'm in Israel and I'm asked to go talk about something. And one of the guys that was there was Shimon Peres. And at the time, he was not the prime minister or the president. He was between those two. But he's, he's a legend. He was a young man at the time of about 80. And I was saying, we've got to get first into all the kids around the world. This year, this year, little Israel had 1,200 first teams. Wow. After about seven or eight years, he calls me up. He says, Dean, I've watched four generations of kids grow up in the Middle East four generations of and I used to think the most important thing to teach kids is history. He said, we have to stop teaching history because by teaching history, every group teaches their own kids their own history and they teach their kids their own truths and all their truths are different. So by the time the kids see each other, they have different truths so they can't trust each other. When you can't trust people, you're afraid of them. When you're afraid of them, you want to kill them. Dean, I've watched the first teams, and when I see these kids, they're all learning the same truths. Math is the same everywhere. The laws of physics are the same everywhere. And these kids are working together, and they're realizing they're all on the same team. They all have to deal with global warming and cybersecurity and food and healthcare. And Dean, what these kids are learning is that if they can master technology the way we do, they can build their own gardens and they won't have to fight over ours.
In my experience, most often dreamers are told they're crazy, they're weird, they stand out because of it, and whatever their idea is, they're often told that it's dumb or crazy, never gonna happen, and they have to fight that resistance and fight all of the people around them, telling them not to do the thing to make it actually happen. And then once it actually happens, they're brilliant and they're a genius and they're all those things, right? Chairman and CEO of XPRIZE, Dr. Peter Diamandis. It is so wonderful to have all of you here. It truly, truly is. Just, just tremendous reunion of a family, a family who dares to dream. It really was an amazing journey of unknown 10 years ago uh, because at first it was, we had no idea where the money was coming from. Uh, then we had no idea whether we could really pull this thing off. And then we had no idea if anyone could pull it off by the deadline. And then we didn't know if the vehicle, well, you knew of course, Bert, but we didn't know that the vehicle would actually work as advertised. A friend of mine gave me a copy of Murphy's Law, which I put on, he put on the wall across from me and it, Murphy's Law says if something can go wrong, it will. And that negative mindset really pissed me off. So I went to my whiteboard and I wrote, uh, if anything can go wrong, fix it to hell with Murphy. I'm a child of the 60s and it was the Apollo program going on that lit my heart on fire. Here I am as a kid watching humans walking on the moon. That's one small step for man. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. It was something which I thought, my God, that's incredible, and I want to do that too. And then this incredible television show called Star Trek comes online. And while Apollo is showing us what we're doing right now, Star Trek is showing us where we're going, what is possible in the next few hundred years. And the combination of that one-two punch lit me on fire, wanting not only to go to space, but to help make that future for humanity happen. As I grew up, I realized a few things. Number one, my chance of becoming an astronaut were one in a thousand. I mean, maybe one in 10,000. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration selected three veteran astronauts as the crew of Apollo 10. And then along the way, as I met many astronauts, I realized, you know, I don't want to actually be a government astronaut. I want to do this privately. That was my dream. How do I help open up space commercially? There was one man who was so important to the story because he gave me the gift of a book, a Pulitzer Prize winner, written in 1954, called The Spirit of St. Louis. And my dear brother Greg gave me that book to encourage me to finish my pilot's license, which it did. But as I'm reading that book, I, I was making note of how much money people were spending trying to go after this $25,000 prize put up by Raymond Ortega. And I'm like doing the calculations. And this $25,000 Ortega prize, offered in 1919, inspires nine different teams who spent $400,000 trying to win this $25,000 prize to fly from New York to Paris nonstop. And I'm doing the math and saying, wow, that's, he offers 25K, there's 16 times that amount spent, and he only pays the winner, which is Lindbergh, which is the most unlikely person to do it. And as I finished reading the book, I said, that's it, I'm gonna create a prize for private space flight. I went to probably 150 benefactors and sponsors asking them for support, but I can't raise the $10 million, which was the prize amount. I went and pitched Fred Smith and I pitched 100 plus CEOs and I had the pleasure of pitching you twice. You want to talk a little about the origins of that? I normally am known as Dr. Yes, and I remember distinctly when you came to see me 
everything said, said I should say yes. And I don't know why no came out of my mouth, but, but <laughs> strangely, if I had said yes, we may not all be, you know, we may not have been sitting here today with, um, with, with, with our spaceship in, in the hangar next door. So they all said, isn't this too dangerous? Someone's gonna die. Why isn't NASA doing this? And can we really pull it off? I'd like to take a moment now to describe three programs that we are announcing here today. We announced this prize in May of 1996 under the Arch of St. Louis. The first is, in fact, the X Prize, a $10 million contest that we are organizing here. But I didn't have $10 million. And this $10 million award will be going to the winner, which is the first team to do the following. And I didn't have any teams. To privately build a spaceship, and privately finance that ship, a ship that's able to fly to 100 kilometers altitude, carry three individuals, and do that twice inside of two weeks. Land safely and within the same ship in two weeks, do it again, you win $10 million. Don't care how you do it, as long as you do it. We were in Hawaii with my family on vacation. And my assistant called me, it's like, there's this guy who calls and, you know, I keep telling him you're not here. He's very persistent, he wants to meet you. And I asked her, well, what does he want? And uh, she explained that, I don't know, but I think he wants to talk to you about space, something to do with space. And that was the magic word. And the next, the first meeting we ever had was with you. And you came in with all your presentation materials and PowerPoint and very nervous. And I didn't know at that time that, you know, this was like the last <laughs> <laughs> prayer that you had in saving the, the organization. So we sat and we listened. Anusha Ansari is an extraordinary woman. She had just sold her company called Telecom Technologies to Sonus Networks for $1.3 billion. And she sold the company, went on vacation to Hawaii for, I think, six months. I tracked her down. In all of my interviews, I had always talked about my passion for space. I'm wanting to be an astronaut and fly to space. I saw her as the perfect person to fund my X Prize after 150 people had said no. After, afterwards, we said, uh, this, is, this is the guy. This is the guy who's going to make it happen, and we became part of it. And, and Bert, I, I believe remember. it's a good thing yeah. to have a dream for yourself, but very often people get stuck in what I call the linear dreaming pattern, which is they work hard at their dream, they hustle, they make the sacrifices, they pay the dues, and then in hope to say, one day I'll be prosperous, you know, I'll have some prosperity. And what I'm saying is that we all have the opportunity to not only be a dreamer for ourselves, but it's our mission to also be a dreamer for other people's dreams to me is the fastest way to fuel your prosperity. Continue to find your tribe. Continue to find your tribe. The great thing about the world that we're living in now, which was different than when I was growing up, was you are one keystroke away to finding that other community. There are so many pockets of them. You know, don't think that you're alone because the very fact that you're living through something means that someone else is also living through that exact same experience as well. And through your own conviction and your own belief that the thing inside of you is valuable because the thing inside of all of us is valuable we can bring our passions to life and ultimately change the world. It just it resonated with me so much because this is what I wanted to do all my life and I knew there were many others like me. And uh, instead of just me flying to space, I, I figured that this would be a way to make a huge difference, to allow not just for me, but everyone like me to go to space and not just do it once, it, be it can become you know, something like the airlines. People ask, when do you give up on your dream? And the answer is, if it is your true passion, what I call your massively transformative purpose, the answer is never. There's gonna be a hundred no's or a thousand no's and you only fail when you give up if it is your true dream. Why are you here on this planet? You know, what is it that drives you to wanna to go and be everything you can be.
Ultimately, we had 26 teams from seven countries. They spent $100 million in total to try and win the $10 million prize. And Burt Rutan, backed by Paul Allen, made the flight on September 29th and October 4th of 2004. Being a dreamer is giving your soul permission to fly, to take flight. Playing with anyone who shows up. Three, two, one, release. And release. Don't pre-qualify your playmates. Play black, white, Christian Jew, play. A dreamer is a unicorn who has to listen to your own sound, fall in love with your own beat, because it's not gonna be like anyone else's. And then share your beat with others. Share your rhythm with others. See the unseen, say the unsaid, and do the undone. You never guess the places that I've been You never guess the places that I've been Cause everything is like a dream, yeah But only in that dream that I live in I'm never gonna let the day begin Never gonna let the day begin Everything is like a dream, yeah, but only in that dream that I live in Oh, don't wake me up before you go And I'll just make this bed my own Oh, darling, please just let me sleep Give me my dreams, 